You want Jamie Searns to the Prime Minister? Yeah, yeah. Number one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Jamie Stone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Clearly, the unanimous decision by Highland Council planning to grant consent for the UK's vertical space takeoff in Sutherland is extremely good news. I wonder, I hope that the Prime Minister agrees with me that this would be extremely good for the local economy of the Highlands, but also would provide a huge opportunity for the UK economy in terms of the international satellite market. Prime Minister. I, I, absolutely. I congratulate Launch UK on what they are doing, and as he rightly says, it will create 250 full time jobs. 30 at the facility in Forres, and uh, I have no doubt uh, launch the UK on a path to ever greater presence in the global satellite market. Lee Raleigh. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yesterday evening, the yeah. Prime Minister announced a series of changes that none of us ever wanted to see to keep the virus as low as possible, and residents are understandably concerned and anxious. Would the Prime Minister reassure us all and my constituents in North East Derbyshire that the primary focus of the Government remains on protecting both lives and, just as importantly, livelihoods. Uh, Minister. Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend can certainly reassure his uh, constituents that our purpose and the purpose of the package that I think would uh, carry uh, overwhelming support yesterday in this House is to continue to drive down that R number whilst keeping businesses open and keeping children, keeping pupils in school. Now comes the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Three months ago today, the Prime Minister said test and trace can be a real game changer for us. He was backed up by the Health Secretary, who said finding where people who test positive are is the single most important thing that we can do to stop the spread of the virus. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said the complete opposite. Standing there, he said testing and tracing has very little or nothing to do with the spread or transmission of the disease. Both positions cannot be right. Which one is it, Prime Minister? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, it is, it, is, it is an obvious fact of uh, biology and epidemiology that, alas, uh, this disease is transmitted by human contact or, or aerosol contact, uh, but it is one of the great advantages of, uh, of NHS tests and trace, uh, which we did not have working, alas, uh, earlier in the pandemic, it was, we simply didn't have it in the spring, and it is the, the result is uh, that we now have the ability to see in granular detail uh, where the epidemic is breaking out, exactly which groups are being infected. That's why we've been able uh, to deliver the local lockdowns, and that's why we're able to tell now at this stage that it is necessary to take the decisive action that we are, and which, yeah, and which I think he supports, or he did yesterday anyway, uh, to drive the virus down, keep kids in school and keep our economy moving. That's the point, Mr Speaker. So why yesterday did the promise to say that testing and tracing had very little or nothing to do with the spread or transmission of the disease? <laughs> Mr Speaker, I, I, I hesitate, I hesitate to, to reprove the uh, right honourable gentleman for a, a, a flaw he seems sometimes to fall into is not listening to my previous answer. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, I gave a very, I very, gave a very, very clear answer. The answer is, it is a simply, and sadly, it is an epidemiological fact that transmission of the virus takes place by a human uh, contact from person to person. What test and trace enables us to do is to isolate uh, the cases of the virus in ever greater detail, which we weren't able uh, to do before, Mr. Speaker. And thanks to the efforts of NHS Test and Trace, many thousands of people, trainees. Uh, nurses, doctors, uh, young people, armed, members of the armed services, uh, we now have, we're not only testing more capacity, uh, testing more than any other country in Europe, but capacity today is at a record high. And I think you should pay tribute to their work. Yes, Mr Speaker, I listened to the answer that the Prime Minister gave to the questions. That's why I asked him the question, because yesterday he said the complete opposite of what he said today. Everybody who is in the chamber, everybody in Reeves Hansard will see it. And he talks, he talks about testing. Mr Speaker, can I remind the Prime Minister that last week, before the Liaison Committee, he admitted testing currently has huge problems. Dido Harding said we plainly don't have enough testing capacity. The Health Secretary said fixing testing would take weeks. Pretending there isn't a problem is part of the problem, Prime Minister. It's unclear, and let's test, let's test what the Prime Minister's explanation is. 
is the explanation for the problems that we haven't got enough capacity. The problem, the pro- it says which problem? The problem that he acknowledged one week ago before the liaison committee. Mr. Speaker, is the explanation from the Prime Minister that we haven't got enough capacity because nobody could have expected the rise in demand? That's the Dido Harding defence. Or is it we've got all the capacity we need, it's just that people are being unreasonable in asking for tests? That's the Hancock defence. So which is it? Uh, Mr Speaker, I must say I think that the continual attacks by the opposition on, on, Di- on, Dido, on Dido Harding in particular are, 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 unseemly, are unseemly and unjustified. And I think that, she, and I think that her teams... Her teams have done an outstanding job in recruiting people from a standing duck. This is not for a moment to deny the, the, uh, to deny the anxiety of those who want tests, which I readily accept. Of course, of course, we would love to have uh, much more testing instantly. And, and it is thanks to the efforts of uh, NHS Test and Trace uh, that we are not only at a record high today, uh, testing more people than any other European country. But uh, to get to the point that he raised, Mr Speaker, we're going to go up to 500,000 tests by the end of October. That is, that is the work of Dido Harding and her team. And I think, actually, again, you know, what, what we want to hear, and what I frankly want to hear, is more of the spirit of togetherness that we had yesterday, Mr Speaker. Because, because this, is, this is an opportunity to support... NHS test and trace. This is an opportunity to get behind that scheme, to encourage people to believe in it and its, in its efficacy. Instead, he constantly knocks it from the sidelines, Mr. Speaker. Open this, sir. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think the whip. I'll just say to the whip, there's a little bit of rowdiness coming from here, also from your good self, which I normally never have from you. But we're having a little bit from this side. I want to be able to hear the Prime Minister. When I can't hear the Prime Minister, I do worry about the people who are watching proceedings. If we have further comment, please do so. Speak to me afterwards. Right. Where are we up to? Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows my complaint is not with the NHS, it's with the government. My wife works for the NHS. My mother worked for the NHS. My sister works for the NHS. So I'm not going to take lectures from the Prime Minister on supporting the NHS. The Prime Minister says we've got capacity, goes on and on about capacity. Let's test that. Three weeks ago, millions of children went back to school. That's a good thing. Then the inevitable happened. Kids get coughs, bugs, flu. That's what happens. It's in the job description. But there's no effective system in place to deal with it. Many can't get tests quickly. Schools are allocated only 10 tests. Many wait days for the results. The outcome is obvious child and siblings off school, mum, dad or carer off work, and in some cases all year groups off school. How on earth did we get into this mess? Prime Minister. Uh, uh, come on, Mr Speaker. Uh, he, he, know, he knows perfectly well that uh, and he, or he'll have read the uh, advice from the four chief medical officers uh, that there's an exceptionally small risk uh, to children of primary and secondary school age from this disease. He knows uh, that children have a significantly less uh, lower rate of, uh, of infection. That's all in the, the letter that they've published uh, today. Uh, but he also, knows, he also knows that we are doing our level best to get every uh, child a test who has symptoms. And further, that thanks to the efforts of uh, teachers in this country, of parents, pupils, 99.9% of our schools are now back. And, 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 and in, spite, in spite of all his attempts, I may say, throughout the summer, to sow doubt on the idea that schools were safe. The, the people of this country had more common sense, Mr Speaker. Yes, such a poor defence. That's such a poor defence. The, the, chil- the point isn't whether the children have got COVID. It's that they've got COVID symptoms, and then they're off school. The government's own department shows that one in eight children are off school this week. That disrupts their education. Whether it's COVID symptoms or other symptoms is, is nothing to the point. If the Prime Minister doesn't see that, he's really out of touch with families and what they're going through in schooling day in, day out in the last few weeks. The reality is losing control of testing is a major reason why the Prime Minister is losing control of this virus. As a result, as a result, he's phasing in health measures, restrictions which we do support, but at the same time, he's phasing out economic support. 
Health measures and economic measures are now dangerously out of sync. Let me quote the Director General of the CBI. There can be no avoiding the crushing blow new measures will bring for thousands of firms. It's vital, she says, that all announcements of restrictions go hand in hand with clarity on the business support to protect jobs. Why wasn't that announced yesterday? Mr Speaker, let's be in absolutely no doubt that the work that this government has done to protect the economy of this country, uh, to support the jobs of 12 million people uh, through the furlough scheme, an overall expenditure of about £160 billion, has been unexampled anywhere else in the world. And I, I think he should pay tribute uh, to the Chancellor and, to, and his work. And we will go forward with further creative and imaginative schemes to keep our economy moving. And that is the essence, Mr Speaker, of the, of the plan, of the proposals uh, that we... Uh, he, he talks about our... He supported them last night, or he supported them yesterday, uh, Mr Speaker. I hope he continues uh, to support them. The essence of what we're saying, Mr Speaker, is that we want to depress the virus, but keep pupils in school and keep our economy moving. And that is the single best thing we can do to support firms across the country. Mr Speaker, I'm not asking about the support that was being put in place in the past. We support that. I'm asking about the support that's needed now, particularly in light of the restrictions announced yesterday. Mr Speaker, this is not theoretical. Yesterday, 6,000 jobs were lost at Whitbread, one of the major employers in the hospitality sector. The CBI, the TUC and trade unions, the Federation of Small Businesses, the British Chamber of Commerce, the Governor of the Bank of England, they're all calling on the Prime Minister to stop and rethink. Support the businesses affected. Don't withdraw furlough. We've been saying it for months. When is the Prime Minister finally going to act? Mr. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, uh, these are indeed tough times, and I have no doubt that many businesses, many employees are feeling a great deal of anxiety and uncertainty, and we will do our level best uh, to protect them throughout this period. But we will get through this, Mr Speaker, by precisely the methods that we have outlined and that were agreed upon in this House yesterday. And I, I may say, I think that the, uh, the, 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 what the reality of the, of the opposition position has been exposed. The cat's out of the bag, uh, Mr Speaker, because it was his shadow education secretary who said of, of, the, of, said of the present uh, crisis, she said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. That's, that's the real approach of the Labour Party, Mr Speaker, seeking, seeking to create political opportunity out of a crisis, out of the difficulties and dangers this country is going through, whilst we are taking the tough decisions. The tough decisions to get this virus down, Mr Speaker, to keep our education system going and to keep our economy moving. He supported it yesterday. I hope he will, in a spirit of togetherness and unity, that he will continue to give it his support. Ben Bradley. Mr Speaker, our local football clubs are hugely important to our communities. Mansell Town is a fine example of a club that both works with and invests in our town, but many sports uh, clubs around the country have found that their hopes of welcoming fans back to stadiums next month have been dashed. Uh, so, given that many football league clubs are so reliant on gate receipts to be viable, can my right hand friend assure me that he'll do everything possible to support these clubs, both as businesses, but for the communities that rely on them too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I know how, what a passionate uh, supporter my honourable friend is of Mansfield Town, and I can tell him, uh, and I want to thank, by the way, John and Carolyn Radford and all they have done uh, for the club. But, and I can tell him that the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport is uh, in active consultations uh, with clubs across the country to see what we can do to help. We now come to the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last night, the Prime Minister and leaders of the devolved governments announced restrictions aimed at stopping the number of COVID cases reaching a predicted 50,000 a day by mid-October. But there are other major threats that we face this October. There is another set of numbers, and all of this is of the Tory government's own making. One million jobs at risk if furlough ends early. £30 billion a year bill to the taxpayer from a no-deal Brexit. And today we learn 7,000 trucks queuing for days at Dover. Mr Speaker, if those numbers become a reality, the Prime Minister is leading us into another winter of discontent. Mr Speaker, our First Minister has shown leadership at all fronts during this pandemic. However, the responsibility and powers for extending the furlough scheme lie with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. The Prime Minister must announce 
an immediate extension, no half measures, no half baked projects to this vital and life saving scheme? Will the Prime Minister show leadership required and save the jobs? Prime Minister. Well, I, I notice that uh, both uh, the leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party and the leader of the opposition now support an indefinite extension of the, of the furlough scheme. Uh, uh, that's, what, uh, that's, what he, that's what he said, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, what, we will, what we will do, as I have said throughout, is continue uh, to put our arms around the people of this country going through a very a tough time and come up with the, 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 the appropriate creative and imaginative schemes to keep them in work and keep the economy moving. That's the essence of our approach. In Blackburn. That's, that's so poor, uh, Mr Speaker. What we're talking about is protecting the jobs of people today. It's not indefinite, and nobody, nobody, Prime Minister, has asked for that. Mr Speaker, the first steps to any recovery is admitting that there is a problem. Even the Governor of the Bank of England is telling the Prime Minister to stop and rethink. The solution for millions of people right now is an extension, an extension, Prime Minister, of the furlough scheme beyond October. The alternative is putting 61,000 jobs in Scotland at risk. Yesterday, the only reassurance the Prime Minister gave those Scottish workers was saying that he would throw his arms around them. Prime Minister, I can tell you the last thing those 61,000 Scots are looking for is a hug from you. They need the security of knowing that they can hold on to their jobs and incomes for themselves and their families. Time is running out. Workers are facing the dole today. Will the government instruct the Chancellor to extend the furlough scheme and stop one million workers being sold onto the scrap heap by this government? Prime Minister. Well, I, what I can certainly uh, tell him is that, of course, uh, the furlough scheme has already been extended until the end of October. People should be no doubt about that. And uh, uh, as I've said before, we will continue uh, to provide uh, the best support we can possibly give to keep people, get people, and new jobs are being created, Mr. Speaker, get people into work uh, whilst. Uh, suppressing the virus, and I know that uh, he, he may not know. I can imagine that he doesn't want a hug from me, uh, but uh, I could, uh, that was a metaphor, Mr. Speaker. And uh, what we're perhaps it's, it's, it's more it's physically incarnated by the uh, 12.7 billion pounds uh, of Barnet uh, consequentials that we're seeing uh, come uh, from the UK Exchequer to support people across the whole of our country. I suspect you might get a hug though from Andrew Bowen. Oh, well, I could possibly, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, not, not in present company. Um, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting that the uh, leader of the Scottish National Party went on jobs, given that on this side of the House we voted this week and last to protect 500. Thousand jobs enshrining Scotland's most important market, our internal UK market, in statute. Why does my right honourable friend think the SNP did not support this bill? Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no idea. It's totally baffling uh, because this is a bill uh, that under underpins a massive transfer of powers back to uh, back to Scotland from Brussels. From Brussels, about 70, 70 powers and prerogatives go back to Scotland, which they would throw away again. As Mr. Speaker, they would throw again, throw away again the entire beautiful, glistening hall of the UK's uh, or Scotland's spectacular marine wealth. Hand our fisheries straight back. And Scotland's fisheries straight back to Brussels. That's what they want to do. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, a RSPB report noted that the UK has, lost, uh, has seen a lost decade for nature, uh, with the government failing to reach 17 out of 20 targets that it had signed up to. Now, there's a major UN biodiversity summit next week. It is a vital moment to put this right and to show some real leadership. Now, the EU's Biodiversity Summit aims to protect a minimum 30% of land and sea for nature by 2030. So, will the Prime Minister commit now to at least match that goal, 30% of land and sea for nature by 2030, and deliver the funding via the forthcoming spending review? Prime Minister. Well, I, 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 she, the Honourable Right Honourable Lady simply cannot be unaware that the, uh, the campaign uh, to get the world's leaders to sign up to a leader's declaration, uh, Mr Speaker, on biodiversity was led, has been led over the last few weeks by this government. And it is this government, you know that, she knows that, Mr Speaker, it's this government that devised the Charter, it's this government that's leading the world in protecting biodiversity across the planet, and we will put in the funding, we pioneered the 30% idea, and we will certainly put in all the funding required. Good Bacon. Mr Speaker, there is growing concern in my constituency of Orpington and across the country 
about the rising number of illegal crossings across the Channel. In order to stop these dangerous journeys, to save lives and to protect our borders, the UK must deter people from making these crossings. The law in this area is complex, so can my right honourable friend assure my constituents and the country that at the very latest a comprehensive bill to deal with this problem will be brought before the House uh, following the next Queen's speech? Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend because he's completely right that the legal position is currently very uh, difficult because of the inflexible and rigid uh, Dublin uh, regulation for, uh, for returns. And what's happening now, is, and so people think there is a way, a way in that uh, is legally very difficult to resist, tragic for those who are coming across in, uh, in rubber dinghies or, 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 or children's uh, uh, paddling pools, uh, 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 cheated by a gangs uh, as they are. Uh, we must find a better way of, of doing this. Once we uh, are out of the EU, able to uh, make our own uh, return uh, arrangements, uh, able to settle our own laws in this matter, I've no doubt that we'll find a way forward. Graham Morris. Uh, th thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I do hope, respectfully, the Prime Minister isn't ha having problems with his memory, because just yesterday... Can, can I remind him, you know, we've just had a, a recent exchange there where metaphorically you promised to put your arms around the British people and support jobs and the economy. Now, now we know that the CBI and the TUC, businesses and mm. unions, uh, employers and workers, and, and now even the Bank of England are united in a call for a targeted expansion in the COVID job retention scheme. And make no mistake, there's a tsunami of job losses in the pipeline within 38 days. So will the Prime Minister please listen to those advice, to that advice and take urgent action? And I'd like a yes or no answer, please. Yes. Prime Minister. Well, I, 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 I think that the uh, Honourable Member is, is entirely right about the, the gravity of the situation. Uh, it, and it, although it is true that some firms uh, are, are, are powering uh, through this, many, many face very, very difficult, very difficult uh, circumstances. And that's why we've Put in the support that we have. That's why there's the don't forget there's the job a retention bonus at the end of, of the year to, to, to help people uh, to help uh, firms to keep people uh, in employment. But also that's why we're looking at a, a massive package now uh, of investment in jobs and growth in the medium and the, the short, medium and, and the long term. And you look at the two billion pound uh, kickstart fund uh, that we've already put in place. It's about £640 billion of investment o o overall in infrastructure. And, and what I can tell the House is, in, in addition to the package that I set out yesterday, as I said earlier on, as I said to the right honourable gentleman, there will be creative and imaginative measures from the Chancellor to help people through this crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Prime Minister, like you, one of my top priorities is improving education and spreading opportunity across Devon and the West Country. I welcome the new one billion school rebuilding programme which will help refurbish 50 schools from next year. Tiverton High School in my constituency is currently in a flood zone, but we do have permission to build a new school and move out of the flood zone. So, Sammy Crook, the head teacher, the governors and the Devon County Council are all backing this scheme. Um, could I make an early bid for Tiverton High School? Could you back us to have a new school in, in, in the rebuilding programme to raise the aspiration um, and the opportunity for the great young people of Tiverton? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the cause of education in Tiverton could have no more fervent and more effective advocate uh, than my, than my honourable friend. And I can tell him, although the first 50 schools, the first 50, the first 50, have not yet been announced. I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, will have heard that powerful cry, and I have no doubt that he will be answered. Patrick Reddy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does he understand that as long as these powers are reserved, it is the government that has to meet the costs that come with the pandemic? So he can either do that by extending the job retention schemes, especially for those who are excluded, or through sector specific support. Or he can pay the long-term price of long-term unemployment, increased social security, and all the damage that comes to the economy and the society with it. So, which of those is it going to be? What is his vision for building back better? I thank uh, the, the honourable member. Very simply, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is to keep doing uh, what we have doing, but to intensify our support for every part of the uh, of the union from. Uh, from spaceports, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to backing uh, our armed services throughout 
uh, the whole of the UK to investing in our healthcare. That is what we will do. And the overall Barnet consequentials, uh, as I've said uh, so far, uh, are £12.7 billion. Pounds, and we will, continue, we will continue to provide that support, Mr Speaker. James Wilde. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Saturday, I was at Norwich City's match as part of the pilot to let fans back into football. And it's disappointing that the reopening has now been postponed. And with Kingsley Town, Mansfield and many other clubs and sports facing a real threat to their viability with no fans coming into the grounds, will my right honourable friend urgently look at the sports recovery fund to ensure their viability and their place at the heart of our local communities? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it, it, it grieves me to uh, see uh, uh, football clubs, uh, uh, Mansfield others, uh, in Norwich City, uh, not able to go back in the way that they want to right now, and uh, I totally sympathise with, uh, with him and with, and with the fans. And I, I, wish we, I really wish we did not have to do this now. I really wish we did not have to do this now. The best way, obviously, uh, to get through it, as I say, is to, is to, do, is to follow the advice and, and suppress the virus. But in the meantime, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, is looking actively at solutions to help uh, Norwich City and other clubs. Yeah, Let's head up to Adrian Schultz with Neil Gray. Neil Gray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sometimes doing the right thing isn't easy, but in this case it is essential. It's clear that doing the right thing to stop the spread of COVID-19 is going to have a social, business and economic impact. But as yet, the UK government haven't moved to ensure in this new phase that there is full security for those doing the right thing. So will he do the right thing and look now as a minimum at the support available to businesses, in particular the self-employed who may need to self-isolate repeatedly or be back in the realm of zero income, extend the furlough scheme and ensure the limited universal credit uplift is expanded to legacy benefits and made permanent? Okay. Well, well th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the honourable gentleman is, is right in the sense that, of course, the government is going to come forward with, with further measures. I, I, I don't think that it would be sensible simply to extend the current uh, existing furlough scheme uh, in its present form beyond uh, the end of October. But we will do everything uh, we can uh, to support businesses, to support uh, those in jobs, and indeed uh, the self-employed, as the honourable gentleman rightly says. So, who it? Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents in Meriden understand the need for more housing, but the majority of Meriden is greenbelt land. And across Meriden, in places like Balsall Common, Dorridge, Knoll, Dickens Heath, Hockley Heath, Catherine de Barnes and Hampton and Arden, residents are quite rightly concerned about the pressures on the greenbelt. So can the Prime Minister confirm that his government is a brownfield first government and can he also confirm he'll do everything he can to protect our precious greenbelt? Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly can, Mr Speaker. It was a former Labour planning minister who said the greenbelt is a Labour achievement and we intend to build on it, is what he said. Uh, the government's approach is entirely different. Uh, our planning reform will not uh, change. That's, that's what they want to do, Mr Speaker. Uh, we will not change existing policy to protect uh, green belt. And uh, our housing uh, targets, which are very, very ambitious, will focus, as he rightly says, on Brownfield. Yeah. Heading to South London with Florence Sessionlomi. Florence Sessionlomi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unsafe cladding is leaving hundreds of leaseholders across Vauxhall unable to sell or remortgage their properties. The EWS1 forms are not being used as intended and leaving my constituents trapped between risk-adverse lenders and irresponsible building owners. They have been waiting three years already. So can the Prime Minister tell me what steps he's taking now to resolve this really dangerous situation? Uh, I, Mr Speaker, I, th I thank the Honourable Ex. I am aware of this uh, problem of uh, people facing uh, real disadvantage, leaseholders and others, because of the uh, of unsafe cladding still on their on their buildings. I think it is uh, it is it is disgraceful, and uh, both ACM and HPL uh, cladding, in my view, should come off as fast as possible when we are investing uh, massively uh, to achieve that as fast as we can. But I. I, 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 I Sincerely appreciate the problem that she raises. Oh, Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2006, Menhenyet Parish Council were told of improvement plans to their dangerous junction on the A38, something I've long campaigned for. But two months ago, the regional director of the South West part of Highways England told me this was not going to happen, blaming the change from the, the old highways agency. Can my right honourable friend tell me when? If ever, the people of Menhenyet will finally see shovels in the ground. 
Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm grateful to my honourable friend because she, she gave me advance notice of this question. I think this is really a case for Project Speed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I hope that uh, Highways England, who are currently undertaking a safety study uh, of, the, uh, of, of the A38 between Bodmin and Saltash, uh, will be able to accelerate their work and uh, get on uh, with Menheniot uh, Junction as fast as possible. Shubhambat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before lockdown, children on free school meals finished education on average 18 months behind their classmates, and the gap was getting worse. Schools closed and a quarter of these children did less than one hour's schoolwork a day. Lockdown was temporary, but the impact could be lifelong. To help these children catch up, and in the spirit of togetherness invoked by the Prime Minister earlier on, will his government give time for my bill to close the digital divide and give children on free school meals access to internet in their homes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, the Honourable Lady because she's raising a, a very important point uh, and uh, getting kids into school, getting kids back into school has been the most uh, important objective that we've had over the last uh, few months. I'm glad that, that it's, it's got underway, but, but she's right in what she says about the digital divide and that's why we're in, uh, investing massively in online education, uh, giving uh, many, many thousands of 220,000 laptops uh, and tablets and putting routers in schools across the country. That is what we are going to do and uh, I want to see a world in which every school in our country has full uh, gigabit broadband uh, with, the, with the equipment that will, will, will give, give, the, give the, uh, the, the pupils uh, the equipment and the access to the internet that they need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would my right hon. Friend agree that as the UK's performing arts are a global gold standard, which are not only the envy of the world, but also a vital showcase for UK PLC across the world, we should treasure it, and we should look after that industry. And we've had the furlough and other schemes, job retention schemes, but there are those that have fallen through the cracks. And that, uh, Mr Speaker, are the freelancers. We must do something to protect the freelancers, the actors, the costumiers, the prop makers, many others. Can we do something to look after those people? Right, Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the, the, uh, that is a very, very Im important point because uh, obviously the job retention scheme has been very, very effective in keeping people in work, but there are, of course, people who don't have uh, employment of, of that kind. That's why we uh, have given £1.57 billion uh, to support the creative culture uh, media sectors, uh, including the theatres. Uh, we will do whatever we can uh, to support uh, the freelancers uh, that he described because they are the, they are the backbone of our, our, of, our, of our theatrical world, uh, which is, uh, as he knows, and it, it is the, the jewel in the crown of the, uh, of the London cultural economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Returning to Scotland with Ronnie Cowan. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The word is that Downing Street is taking control of the upcoming review of gambling legislation. Is this true? And if so, will Number 10 consider all the recommendations made by the APPG on gambling-related harm in our report published in June. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, it, what I can certainly tell the Honourable Gentleman is that uh, I am not an enthusiast for encouraging the spread of, uh, of gambling in this country. Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Like the vast majority of the British public, I support the new restrictions. And the Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister, said we will get through this. For long term, there are only three routes out of this pandemic. One is to eradicate the virus, two, gain herd immunity, or three, suppress the virus and reduce the deaths until a vaccine or highly effective treatment arrives, such as the ones that the brilliant researchers of South Cambridgeshire are working on. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, tell me which one of these three routes is the government taking us? I must. Number three, Mr Speaker. Final question, Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Only time will tell, Prime Minister, whether the predictions made this week by the medical advisers about deaths and infections of coronavirus have any credibility, or whether they are ex as exaggerated as the claims that there will be half a million deaths within weeks made at the beginning of the year. What is not in dispute, however, is that the scare tactics being used and the regulatory actions taken 
will have an immediate impact on high streets, the hospitality industry and further devastation for the aviation industry. Since the economic consequences are borne by people, businesses and local economies, will the government make a commitment to, first of all, retaining continued support for employment, giving resources to devolved authorities to help local economies and suspending our passenger duty to stave off bankruptcies and save jobs. Well, Mr. Speaker, he makes a, 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 the Honourable makes a powerful uh, point of scepticism about the about the uh, the medical uh, forecasts. All I can say is that uh, everybody should look at the uh, what's already happened in the first phases of this uh, pandemic and be in, in no doubt that it is possible that such a thing could happen again. And it's precisely to avoid that that we are taking the steps now that we are, because a stitch in time saves nine. And there'll be far more damage to the economy uh, throughout our country uh, if we failed uh, to control the virus now and we saw uh, we were obliged to uh, put in seriously uh, damaging lockdown measures that really affected uh, every, every business in the country. And that's why we're taking the approach that we are now, uh, and that's why I think it has the support, and I hope it has the support uh, of him and his, uh, his party as well. But I can certainly tell him uh, that the, the advantage of this approach is that it will allow us not just to keep that virus down if we all follow the guidance, if we all do follow the package that we've set out, keep that virus down, but also enable education to continue and our economy to go forward. And, and of course, we will uh, continue to support businesses in, in Northern Ireland and across the country throughout the period. In order to allow the safe exit.